wanted to start today because it's um, still November and not long after the end of our celebration or I don't know what you would call it, a wake for the First World War. Um, one of the sequences of poems in this new book is dedicated to John Stallworthy. And I thought, for those of you who don't know who John Stallworthy uh, was, um, he, w he taught at Cornell for some time. He then went back to England where he was brought up and educated. And um, uh, the last years of his life was spent teaching poetry at Oxford. But um, I was very, very fortunate. I think that John was actually on the faculty of Cornell when I first started writing poetry. And he was a great mentor and encourager. And he was a great biographer. His book about Wilfred Owen is a classic book that won all sorts of prizes. So I thought I'd start by reading a couple of short poems by him in this volume called War Poet. And I'm choosing it partly because it's got an incredible photograph of an Anzac on Gallipoli Beach carrying a wounded soldier. And John always said that he could have been a love poet, but he grew up in the shadow of the Second World War. He was educated during his school days um, on all sorts of ceremonies for the Second World War. And his mother lost a brother in the First World War and told him many stories about other friends of hers who died in the war. And he ended up turning towards the theme of war time and time again, and always with a great sadness and I think a tremendous empathy for people who went to war who were not necessarily looking forward to going to war but were forced into going to war for one reason or another or felt that they should go to war. Um, and I think in the case of Wilfred Owen, especially thinking of the terrible sadness that he died in the last hours of the war and that the ceremony was held until the 11th hour, the 11th day, the 11th month, deliberately so that the, they would have a nice tidy end to the war. So I'm going to read a very short poem of John's entitled Goodbye to Wilfred Owen. And there's a little epigraph. Killed while helping his men bring up duck boards on the bank of the Sombre <coughs> Canal. After the hot convulsion, this cold struggle to break free. From whom? I am not myself, nor are his hands mine, though once I was at home with them. Pale hands his mother praised, nimble at the keyboard, paler now and still, waiting to be prized from wood darker for their pallor. Head down in a blizzard of shrapnel, before the sun rose we had lost more than our way. Disembodied mist moves on the goose-fleshed canal, dispersing slowly like the last plumed exhalations of the dead. And another little poem called War Story. Of one who grew up at Gallipoli, not over months and miles, but in the space of feet and half a minute, wading shoreward with a plague of bullets pocking the sea, he tripped as it seemed to him, over his scabbard and stubbed his fingers on a dead man's face. This is the, um, the special edition of the Oxford Book of War Poetry that they brought out to coincide with the beginning of the tenery of the First World War, 1914. 2014, he produced this book. And um, you'll see in the poem that I'm going to read of my own about him that it was a gift to me on my birthday and <clears throat> very soon afterwards he died and it was a great loss to English poetry in general not just because he was a, I think a very great poet himself but because he was such a, a champion of the poets that he most admired including two poets that didn't see eye to eye at all Yeats and Wilfred Owen. Um, Yeats did not approve of Wilfred Owen's anti-war poems. Um, I think Yeats always wanted heroes. So I'm going to begin with three poems in a sequence. The first poem is about letters we exchanged. The second one is called Reenactment, about walking with him in 2013 through the grounds of Blenheim Palace, 
through the park at Blenheim, where there was a reenactment going on, not of the Second World War, but of the Civil War in England. And it was a very extraordinary occasion. We, these elaborate reconstructions of uniform and weapons with little children all dressed up in perfect costume and so on. The third poem is about John's last days and this volume and so on. And it's called Reenactment. My birthday and soon the great wars. Beside the guest bed, a scarlet rose, the kind your wife admired, single, fragrant, and your book of war poems. You missed the birthday dinner, a problem you'd had with swallowing, but we could make an early start, retrace last year's sunlit walk through the park to Woodstock and the feathers. At breakfast, you read a poem you'd chosen for the book, Hecht's More Light, More Light. Much casual death had drained the, away their souls. Then we paid homage to her garden, flowers true to their species, wallflower, stock, a rose she'd hoped she'd live to see. No reenactors disturbed the grass at Blenheim, but you talked of the war poet you were and the love poet you wished you'd been. Watched swans glide above their darker doubles. You spoke of a woman you loved who flew decades ago to spend two nights with you at the end of Africa, now alone. You wondered where this might lead as we found a table, the same as last year. We drank wine and laughed, ignorant of the dark mass couched in your throat, the strangler about to close its grip. We spoke of next year's reenactment as if an endless succession of sunlit walks stretched ahead. A kiss at the station to seal our promise, I left for home. A week later came a call, the verdict of your test. Your warm voice chilled me. Chance of parole, small. Barely a year since your wife's funeral, then came Seamus's turn. No death is casual for lovers or friends. And you, a war poet, were always a poet of love. No death drained the soul from you as you battled to name, remember, pity the ones death chose. Here, in a still bright autumn, no news from the front. I try to read Silence's Hope. Next year, I say, we'll reenact our walk, our talk. I am the woman who went to Africa, she wrote, knowing all I knew of her was this. And she came to him because he called and asked her to. A lifetime later, unasked, she came to share what time was left. She uh, no sooner had he found his youthful muse than life was forfeit to his cancer. As she sat there beside his bed, there were moments surely together again when suddenly the autumn garden glittered beyond a window bright with rain. And eye met eye, hand sought hand, and they forgot the future, wordless in the presence of an unexpected rapture that lit the hours before the darkness. Um, I feel like Monty Python and now for something completely different um, I will go back to the first sequence of poems in the book and the first poem, the title poem Lucky Country, which is an epithet frequently applied to Australia and there was a book called The Lucky Country um, about why it's applied to Australia, it is sort of far away in the middle of nowhere and pretty wealthy and pretty empty and um, didn't have any war on its soil until now, but um, uh, so we grew up in this, well, I grew up and my husband did in this so-called lucky country. They called it a lucky country, fortunate to be an enormous island in the South Pacific, a level playing field for some to rise like my cockney father, a boy from the East End, whose accent was enough to place him in the old country. Among descendants of convicts and their keepers, he could become a gentleman. Once he took me to see the London he raised me on with stories of pockets picked and jellied eels that stuck to your ribs, of peas pudding, music halls, and pearlies with shiny suits, and how a watch pinched back an hour after selling would earn a boy a shilling. It's gone, he said, the East End I knew. 
as he stared at rows of cheap clothes flapping in a damp wind, Indians now selling jeans and drab dresses. There's a place I know where it still might be, he said, and we left for Billingsgate Market, where men in leather hats sold fish and tankers unloaded a sluice of eels into roiling troughs, where insults were traded in rhyming slang. Music to him, familiar to me as his curses aimed at cows, flat tires, children. Now I saw my father at home in a place where I was a stranger, a vanishing world. Satisfied I'd caught the gist of his East, he stuck a cigarette to his lower lip and whistled two little girls in blue. I doubted his London no more than Dickens. It was all child's play to us, the things he did to stay alive before he came to the empty land where a cockney lad could turn himself into a gentleman. My great-grandfather was a hairdresser on Princess Street, Edinburgh. This was a fairly comfortable place to have a hairdressing salon, you know, it was for women and men, and it was a posh street in Edinburgh, the main street of the town. I don't think his wife had any idea of the fact that there was no money at all, because he used to spend his weekends teaching prisoners in Edinburgh jail to make uh, morning uh, memento mori, these morning brooches and ornaments that were made of human hair. So with the sweepings out of the salon, he would go to the jail and teach them this, and presumably went through all the money in the family, because when he died quite suddenly, first his wife died and then quite suddenly he died, he left two daughters absolutely penniless. And um, uh, so my, uh, my great-grandmother and her sister went to the local clergyman and said, what are we going to do? You know, how can we find husbands? How can we exist? We don't have any money. And um, he said, well, you know, you go out to Botany Bay and there are lots of men out there without any <laughs> women. <laughs> so these two girls packed up and got on a sailing ship and, and six months later they arrived in Botany Bay. Botany Bay was at that stage full of convicts and the only women were prostitutes and um, they knew they couldn't stay there. So somehow or other they got to Melbourne where they did what you did if you wa didn't want to be a prostitute, which was to go into service, uh, in other words, to be a maid. And so they were maids, the two sisters. One married, one remained uh, a maid in a rather mean household where, where she was treated rather stingily and uh, resented it for the rest of her life. So this is legacy about my great-grandmother. These things are left me, her wedding ring, snug even on my right pinky, a cape of taffeta trimmed with tassels, a wooden box, its lid brass rimmed. What did she carry from Scotland to the raw shore where a penniless girl might marry a sex-starved settler? Thread, needles, a darning egg, a cape saved for the day she stepped on the earth's underside, a wisp of her mother's hair knotted in intricate macrame by a father who'd learnt the art of memento mori. Her face, sombre on faded glass, gives no hint of intimacy. Only the ring's glint betrays the settler she outlived, and on her taffeta lap, a round-eyed child, stiff with starch and fear. Um, so uh, I went to uh, a one-room schoolhouse uh, when I was, uh, from when I was about eight or twelve or eleven or when you go to high school. We already lived in the country in those days. It's now out of suburbia of Melbourne, but there was no school nearby. So I went up in a bus to this one-room schoolhouse where the headmaster stood here and his wife stood there, and she had grades one to three, and he had grades four to six, and uh, he was an um, terrifying to me, absolutely terrifying. He had this red face and he had been in the British Army in India and um, he whacked the boys whenever they behaved badly and he shouted at the girls and, and um, later on I found out something quite interesting about him that changed my view of him and stopped me being quite so scared of him and it's called The Headmaster's Secret. 
He ruled us with a disappointed rage, a cravat tied under his brick-red chin. When he died, I learned of his secret life, the affair he'd had with a woman painter who'd married a doctor, but thought herself free to love where she pleased and chose him. If I'd known the headmaster's secret, I'd have filled the hours from nine to four, not dreading the savage lash of his tongue, but picturing them down on the studio floor, his face a darker shade of brick, hers transformed by his ardent assault. <laughs> this is the last in the series of poems which are to do with family and Australia, and it's called Looking Down on the Lucky Country. We fly all day over desert. No wonder the second comers who tried to cross it died. The colors are faded paint, rivers snaked like sidewinders, then stop. The country gave itself grudgingly to the ones who came and stayed in the Stone Age. They knew only one secret mattered, water, and where to find it. So they sang their way across the land, memorizing each source, bequeathing a map to survival from one generation to the next, stopping to greet members of their totem, passing on. Near the coast, browns turn green, iron roofs wink in the sun, highways lead to a busy city. If the sea should rise and take a bite out of this coast, it would all be gone, this crust of settlement where we grew up, ignorant of the whole, thinking we knew it. Um, the second sequence in the book is, um, it's called Rounded, and it has to do with coming to Ithaca and, um, you know, becoming, uh, this becoming my country and feeling as if I belong to it, which had a lot to do with um, getting to know nature around here and hiking and so on. And um, at first I was just bewildered by... Um, the profusion of colour in, in the fall, and it was just too much for me. In fact, I found it almost uh, claustrophobic, the green of, of summer here, because both Greece, where I had been living before I came here, and Australia was dun-coloured, you know, grey-green, and, and all this bright, bright colour was a bit much. So this is a little poem called Autumn in Ithaca. I come from a leaner landscape and learned to read its dun shades. The only profusion of colour was wattle, yellowing the bush a month in spring. This autumn colour seems too crude. My daughter will know maple from oak, beech from buckeye, scarlet from gold, not olive from umber, or how clean the peeled ghost gum looks in a paddock of tired summer grass. Um, yes, now... Um, Those of you who hike will know some of you where Round Top is. This is called Winter Walk with Clouds. Walking on Round Top Hill this morning, the temperature steady at eight below. Sun and clouds stipple the slope, charcoal on white. Last summer, the frozen pond at the summit was loud with mating frogs. Woodpeckers beat a tattoo on trunks and squirrels were busy. Nothing moves us now but clouds and their shadows on the snow and ours and the cumuli cumuls of our breath leading us on. I want to read a poem, another poem about us walking. My husband and I do a lot of hiking together and at this one I, uh, you will understand that I married a scientist. On the bridge at Treman Gorge. We stand on the bridge watching the water Leaves land on the surface, turn this way and that, distracted from the flow into eddies, changing direction, the smallest joining a swirl of bubbles in a vortex. I see it as a pattern that pleases the eye. You see it obeying Lagrange's equations. In nature, you've taught me nothing is truly random. The laminar flow devolves into turbulence, order into disorder without apparent pattern. And yet a child makes order of a cloud, scalloping its edges into arched puffs, and water in its wildest flow braids itself like a woman's hair. 
The almost infinite degrees of freedom in turbulent motion should end in chaos, but order creeps in, and order the eye finds in disorder. Um, all right, I'm not going to read too long because I, it gets a bit t tiring listening to people read poetry. I always find, you know, 30, 40 minutes is maximum people can concentrate. So this one is a, a real tale of, of a Christmas hike that we did, um, in, in, which nearly was a disaster, and it's called The Lost Map. It lay beside the trail where I dropped it three weeks ago on Christmas Day. Ice had made the trail treacherous, and you slipped, one foot hanging above the gorge, where water curdled at the edge of its flow. Fear made me careless of all save footholds on the glazed snow as we edged back along the trail to its head. This morning's sun lit patches of snow like sea spume flung on the slope as we retraced our steps beside the gorge, and there it was, beside the path, the lost map folded to fit my pocket, and I was blithe with delight, as if a living thing had strayed and not a sheet creased in two, its ink still bright. I'd marked each section of trail, a year's progress left to right across the map, walks for all seasons, sepia to emerald, flame red to grey, nesting herons, spring startled grass, scutter of deer, a slow snake. This time too, when the woods are all ours and a lost map is safe on the snow. Um, I'll just read one more from... Oh, this is a happy poem. Some of my poems seem to get a bit miserable. This one's a happy poem. It's called Preserves. Each year we pickle them. Plums, apples, apricots from crooked trees that grew around the house, reminders of a former orchard, beans and peas picked at nearby farms. Sometimes my grandfather joined us, slicing fruit for jam, three generations of hands at the kitchen table, pickling beetroot, sterilizing jars, stretching cellophane dipped in vinegar till heat sucked it in and a rubber band sealed it tight. If I could pick this morning like a crispin, I'd slice it in four. Cool shade climbing the gorgeous south rim. Heat on the path down the north side. Diving into the lake for a delicious swim. And coffee, strong, with an almond croissant at the Café on a Creek in the nearby village. I'd keep it in a jar with a cellophane seal, preserved in syrup for a winter pie. Um, so the last um, section that I want to read a poem or two from is called The Body Forgets. Um, and I was invited to I was invited to Lisbon to um, talk to the Portuguese about uh, Rebetica, about Greek sort of popular music because um, they had decided that that Lisbon filled up with tourists in summer, but it was empty in winter, and they wanted to have a winter music festival. So they thought the first, they had this idea that they would do music of the ports. And the first two ports they chose were Piraeus and Lisbon. And so they said, we'd like to do Fado, and we don't need anybody to explain Fado to us. So, but we do need somebody to explain what Rebetica is, and then we'll bring some bands. So, I didn't have any choice about which bands they'd bring. They, they'd done all their homework and they brought a couple of pretty good bands. But I had to sort of talk about what this music was in English. I didn't talk in Portuguese. My Portuguese wasn't up to that. But So I gave this talk. And um, I had lived in Lisbon for eight months, 30 years earlier. And um, like most of us, we had racketed around Europe with no money and um, I always thought that I was a nobody and that I would end up being a nobody but being invited to Lisbon made me feel a little bit important for a day or two. So this is called Lisbon Revisited. Along the Tagus, the docks are alight with clubs, discotheques, bars, drugs, the Euro glitter of Lisbon by night. At the tram stop where tiny pastries were sold, the concert hall blocks the monastery's view, 
vast as a stadium, it cheats the singer of her power to charm even those few who remember her from another life. Was that the door to the house I lived in? It doesn't matter now. It's she, not the Rue de Salbento, that's gone. The girl in green who took the stairs two at a time with a bag of custard apples that April when the scent of limes hung in the air like liberation. I motion the taxi on. Why stop? There's no return to chapter one. No chance to write a different plot and take her backwards out that door, unbuying her fruit in the fragrant square. But you, old friend who stayed behind, more salt than ginger in your fiery hair, tell me I seemed strangely unformed when we met, like the books with uncut pages sold on barrows in the Avenida de Liberdad, waiting the slash of a knife at their edges. I longed to be slipped by some canny Pygmalion, hailed as potential, polished, recast. And here I am now, a guest of the city. There must be something to me at last, a style acquired, a plot that coheres. <laughs> this is called archaeology. It ploughed furrows of the past, turning up buried sounds as it circled, dead sopranos stride piano players, forgotten comedians caught in the narrow plastic grooves a century after they cut aside. A cactus needle would do when we ran out of metal ones to reveal Caruso, Galacurci, no, no, Nanette. Did Spade ever turn up such brilliant remains of a lost civilization? What we could hear through the scratches was a faint copy of sounds that had thrilled an audience no potsherd could tell us what the spinning disc unearthed when we turned a handle. The, voice, the voices of another age reached us cracked yet still alive. Thank you. <laughs>